So uh, everyone, uh, thanks for coming. It's, uh, you know, everyone starts these introductions by saying it's my pleasure to introduce. In this case, it really is my pleasure uh, to introduce. Uh, uh, I've known Ken for a while. In fact, he was my advisor at Cornell. And it's always been, uh, you know, something that I've wanted to do is to be able to, to introduce him uh, as a distinguished lecturer, which is a, uh, a distinction I think he absolutely deserves. Uh, Ken has had a very uh, uh, distinguished career indeed. Uh, he's uh, been at Cornell for about 25 years, I think. Is that right? 25, okay. Uh, and in that time, he's done a number of very interesting things. Um, I guess you could sort of summarize his contributions as focused on developing pro easily programmable distributed systems through better abstractions of the distributed system and more recently has been focused on scalable distributed systems. And over his, the course of his career, he's uh, built systems that have found their ways into important places, like the French air traffic control system in the Swiss Stock Exchange. He also started a company in 1987, which, we ended up, which he ended up selling to Stratus in 1993. So he's done a number of uh, uh, very interesting things, including, of course, publishing lots of influential papers uh, in the meantime. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ken Berman from Cornell University. Thanks, Ken. Great. So, uh, Mike, Mike didn't mention, we, we also did the New York Stock Exchange. Maybe he was afraid that I had something to do with the meltdown of the economy. But in fact, the, uh, the current system doesn't use that anymore. And we did a whole bunch of these kinds of things. So thanks very much, Mike. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, in all your various places. However, that works, and um, and to have a chance to, to to talk today. Let me just mention actually that um, you know you're getting old when uh, you've got a student, Mike in this case, um, who's more distinguished than you are for sure, and um, it's kind of cool at the same time. So I hope that some of you get to that point as well. Um, I want to talk today about uh, technology we've been working on uh, that's aimed at trying to bridge the gap between distributed computing technology and sort of the real world of the web and uh, the trends that the, the web is following towards what people call cloud and, uh, and computing and edge computing, and link these together. So technology we're calling live objects. And um, if you've seen the Minority Report, the movie with, with uh, Tom Cruise, uh, you can think of this as the technology support that Tom was working with when he was uh, trying to do that emergency intervention mission after the precogs uh, have seen a crime about to occur. And he's, pulling content from all sorts of places to try to figure out where this crime is going to happen. And he's, you can tell that it's uh, integrated with other agents out there because you hear him talking to them as, as he's doing this. You know, could it be this? Could it be that? What do you guys have? So it's a, you can think of a sort of next generation of collaboration. And we've, we've gotten very interested in this idea that maybe the future of the web will be that web pages will become very live and uh, that applications will be built the way we build web applications or uh, PowerPoint mashups, other kinds of mashups, um, and shared and uh, shared in, in, in various ways to create all sorts of collaborative applications. So I want to show you how something like that could look and work. We have a system that runs. This is Biscuit, by the way, who's been trying as hard as she can to tell me that it's time to start going skiing. And um, she's probably right about that. So I've, I've uh, started our platform up on here. Now, of course, I've only got one computer, so it's not going to look very distributed. But everything I'm going to show you works in a distributed, uh, scalable way. So we've created uh, a folder uh, here. It's, it's just, this is on Microsoft. You could run this on Linux. And the objects in it are descriptions of little live objects. And so the first one that's going to pop up is a, a text chat window. You'll see it's a bit slow. It's because I keep forgetting to bring the better power supply, and my machine slows itself down when I bring this one. Um, otherwise, it would be pretty snappy. So I can say hello. And of course, there's nobody else listening, so it's not going to um, do anything. But if I run a second instance of this chat window, then it'll come up with the same content initially. And then after that, you'll see updates uh, in both. So we get this out of the way over here on the side. I can put something in it, and it'll echo to the other one pretty much immediately. The, uh, there are two versions of slow. One is slow to start. The other issue is uh, that it waits a second for me to finish typing. Otherwise, this could run with strings like this at about a half a million a second, uh, even on these platforms. Now, what I've done here is, uh, is to work with an object-oriented technology. So just as you get instances of objects in Java when you take a class and then you use new on it, we can actually build multiple instances of this text window. 
And um, I created two instances of the same text window, but here's another one. And this other one is connected to uh, a different communication channel as a result of which changes for it are only visible to people who are mashed with text two. Uh, if they're connected to text one, like this first one was, they'll see updates on text one. So you can think of the channels as naming the, the update um, pads, and then the uh, windows are, are endpoints. And I want you to think in those terms because we see that we can build significant programs this way, but also that what we're building are really graphs of objects. Even these simple objects are graphs of objects. And as we get fancier, we're going to build more elaborate graphs of objects. And then I want to talk a little bit about what happens in a world of graphs of objects of various kinds. So first of all, um, we can create mashups. Mashups is a term that, that was originated by Google for situations like having a map with push pins on it. So our mashup naturally is going to contain text windows, right at the moment at least. Later we'll get a bit fancier. So here's some text stuff. And so then these are in different settings. And you can see that despite the fact that the object is showing up in different places, it acts the same way in the different places. If I do a second text window, uh, they're distinguished by their uh, the desktop window, distinguished by their color. I can put the first type of desktop window in the second one. And this is supposed to kind of lead you towards imagining building collaboration applications by drag and drop. I'm just going to go through fancier and fancier functionality. Um, so for example, here's desktop one in desktop two. See, I can sort of scroll it around, but you see pieces of it. I can put other things there too. I could put a um, an image in it. Let's see what I've got in my pictures area here. Pictures. Put some sort of a picture. That's uh, to make Mike feel nostalgic. This is about the best picture we've got of Cornell Comet over in it. It always looks like that there. Um, okay, and so we're starting to do fairly elaborate things. I could actually put a desktop one in a desktop one. Now, that would be recursion. It's interesting. I'm doing uh, things like recursive programming them without actually uh, doing any code at all. It happens if I did do that, it would throw a stack exception because it would be a non-terminated recursion. The particular uh, windows that we're working with, don't check to see that they're big enough to still display. But if I terminated it by modifying the desktop thing to stop, uh, do, to not do anything if it found itself to be of zero size, then I could literally put desktop one and desktop one, and you'd see a cascade of desktop ones down to a little point. Like if you pointed a TV camera at itself. So let me do one more object just to illustrate the idea a little more uh, in a more fancy version, and then we're going to talk about the technology questions that this raises. Um, to me, uh, as you play around with this sort of stuff, you start to realize that this is sort of the inevitable future of the web. The, and I don't mean that it's our version that could be the future of the web, although it would be nice if that happens, but more that uh, it's obvious the web is heading in this direction. And whether it's me or Microsoft comes out with something, um, that it's clear that, that what Tom Cruise does in that movie, it's not the far future except for the precogs, it's, it's tomorrow. Um, and what's cool about live objects then is that it's giving us a chance to start to think through the research questions raised by tomorrow and to think about them today. This uh, version over here, I'm going to show you uh, a search and rescue mission that, say, a policeman or a fireman might try to create on the fly um, if we were trying to do rescue in New Orleans after the flood. So I've got um, an intersection I want to focus on here. It's that intersection. And suppose there are some things we would like to search. Let me get out of there. So I would like to search a set of buildings. Where are buildings? Buildings have B. Um, and I'm going to drag and drop them right into my um, scenario. I've got a few buildings. OK. So these are buildings. Now, these buildings are uh, connected to live object channels as well. So I want you to start thinking in terms of applications that may have very large numbers of live objects. The video feed of New Orleans, maybe flooding patterns or water flow patterns. Buildings that, as I search them, can uh, have, say, for example, live roofs that change color. I'm going to send a cascade of color messages now from a little controller that lets me do that. I'm sorry about the slow startup. 
It's just because the power supply didn't bring ways a ton. You see how it turned green? Now, now you have to imagine that this was shared with a set of, between the guy who designed this and a set of people who are doing search. So everybody would be in the same scenario, and everybody would be able to do things like searching buildings. And then all the instances of that building would turn green if anybody turned it green. Uh, we'll put some other content here. We'll put some airplanes flying over the top of New Orleans. Um, and the idea with the airplanes is that uh, they've got little GPS. Do you see them? Are they too small to see? Or can people make them out? They're sort of flying around there. In this place where everybody's into high-resolution graphics, this is pretty low-res stuff. Um, and uh, suppose I wanted to reuse components. One of the things that's nice about a component or an object-oriented technology is I can do that. I can, for example, jump into the seat of Airplane 3 by uh, drag let me get in there. dragging uh, Airplane 3's, uh, hang on. I'm having a little trouble getting the orientation to change. I was going to want to do that. There it goes. Wrong way. So this is the view out of the pilot seat of airplane three. All right, And that's uh, taking the same coordinate feed that the airplane modeler, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is using, and just reusing it as a kind of raw feed and dropping it on top of the window. Now again, I could mail this or put it on the web. And if you were to visit this page, if you want to think of it that way, you wouldn't be seeing a copy of it in the sense of looking at a, at a kind of like a two-dimensional display. You'd be as much in the scenario as I am. You could interact with it. For example, potentially you have a pilot's license. Perhaps if you jumped into the seat of Airplane 3, it would pop up. It would realize that, oh, Sheila has a pilot's license and pop up controls and could fly down and, and see if there's anybody in that stadium or something. So that's the idea of live objects. I hope people get it. Um, Programming potentially without um, without really writing code, although very often you would write code. Now I didn't show it to you, but the code for these little uh, live objects had two pieces. There was a web page piece, and what was really in the um, in the folder there were little web page descriptions coded in XML, just like you would expect a web page kind of thing to look like, and uh, you can make sense of it pretty easily. And uh, includes various kinds of parameters. One of the parameters tells me where to find the code for the live object. And others have to do with instantiating it in this setting. And you can think of it as a template we fill out. And then the other piece is the code. And the code are little event loops. It rarely takes more than a few lines of code to do these simple ones that connect the object to its adjacent objects, initialize it. Somebody shares an initial state. That's typically how that's done. And then when events occur, they trigger some action, or you might generate events. So for example, the airplane, what it really was, was a model in a display object and telling it how to reorient the airplane. And then below the model was a GPS coordinate feed, which connects itself to the corresponding plane's GPS feed, and then relays that information so everybody sees the GPS coordinates, including yourself. And uh, as the model sees the coordinates, uh, it re-renders itself. And below that was a multicast channel, which was carrying the GPS coordinates around. So it's, even that little thing was a mashup of four or five objects. So this is the, the thing we're interested in building. And it poses a lot of questions. So, um, so the user's interface is the least of those questions. It's, it's like PowerPoint. You can see it's already working here. Uh, it's quite robust. It's gotten to the point where I give this demo without wincing. I've never yet caused it to go wrong. Uh, the only time I've had problems turned out to be because I inadvertently dragged something to the wrong place. And it turns out that the system has a type checking mechanism. And it throws up exceptions in that case. It says you can't put a text chat window in a 3D animation frame. It doesn't support 3D text interfaces. And it's a perfectly comprehensible type checking kind of message. So at a superficial level, in a sense, live objects already exist. What's more interesting to me is that they raise a lot of questions about scalability and security and self-configurability. Now, traditionally, when people have built distributed systems of various kinds, they've grabbed at the state-of-the-art technology, web-based stuff today, and they've thrown these things together with tremendous urgency and then announced, we've built a new medical record management system. And you say, well, what about security and privacy? And you discover they've been slapping that on after the fact. So what's cool about live objects for us is that here we have a situation where a technology from, say, 10 years in the future has fallen into our hands by virtue of having a grad student who could see where things were heading. You look at this and you realize this is obviously the future. 
And rather than take the view that we're going to build the next Google, our view has been, let's try to do research on the questions posed so that we know a little bit about scalability, which is what I'm going to focus on today, security, uh, type checking, and how those mechanisms can work in favor of robust applications down the road. So that by the time that Microsoft rolls out Windows Live Objects, you know, 10 years from now, having stolen the idea from a demo of mine, um, they, there's a chance that they'll do it right and we'll end up with something that we can trust. And that, that's, um, I think, a, a pretty good goal for me as a researcher. If my student wants to commercialize this, the goal of making a billion bucks is probably not a bad one in his case. But, uh, but this is how we're viewing it, as a, as a rich opportunity for research. Um, and, and something that seems to have obvious applications in lots of settings. In fact, even this early version is getting people excited. Um, so uh, one of the places that's used uh, a lot of software that we did at Cornell is the military. We actually built software that runs the Aegis. And, and um, the Air Force saw a demo of this and got very excited. They said, oh, we have search and rescue missions that have to be thrown together at great urgency, as you could imagine. We've got to go in. We've got to know about weather. We've got to know where the enemy forces are. This is the kind of thing that could make that easier to do. Um, normal non-military kind of planning and coordination, companies working together, and medical stuff, for example. Suppose that you imagined a doctor in a rural clinic who sees something, they're not sure what to make of it. They could, on the fly, build a collaboration application that shows the thing they're worried about to a colleague uh, you know, in, in a bigger medical center. And, um, and then that, that system could sit there running live for a period of time to keep an eye on that patient until they're stabilized. Of course, we'd have to deal with, the, you know, with situations where we have very sensitive data then. And that would, would argue that we need to think through that security issue, and we have the chance to do that now, and so forth. So we think this could be a pretty big deal, and that, uh, that actually the more you think about this kind of a model, the more you see how the web uh, could use this in almost every setting, whether you're into gaming or social networking kinds of apps. Um, it, it's, it's really easy to imagine people who can't program building interesting content this way, just like Second Life. In fact, I didn't show it because I don't have time today. But it turns out Second Life can be done as a live objects application without any programming. One of the things we've got is an interface to a database. And if you've taken database courses, you know about what are called dynamically materialized views, which are queries that get reevaluated when things change. You can imagine a query that's, uh, you can imagine a database of live objects. I told you, they're just XML recipes until you run them on a machine which wakes this thing up. Uh, it's just an XML recipe, pretty small. So you can imagine a database of all the live objects in Second Life. And then when I walked into this room, a query that says, Ken's GPS coordinates just changed. He's in this room. And then that would materialize a little relational view of the uh, visible live objects. And it turns out that's precisely what was going on under the surface. I could pull up a, maybe I'll do that just real fast for you. Um, a different way of visualizing what these airplanes are doing is this uh, shared folder view, which actually shows you that what we've been watching is um, a dynamically changing uh, replicated folder. It's going to pop up over here. And it's got these um, instantiates. So these templates, basically, these web pages, have been parameterized. If I opened one of them, you'd see XML. And, and if I compared, you'd see that some values that were, were um, sort of fill-in fields have been filled in, connecting the template of text one to the channel text one, for example. And um, this could have come from a database that was showing me the objects visible to me if I'm in this room. And then that would be uh, basically how Second Life works, right? You move around and you see objects. But it would be a peer-to-peer -peer version of Second Life, or at least capable of being a peer-to-peer -peer version of Second Life. So uh, Second Life, in that sense, might be a database of live, a namespace or a database of live objects. When I design Ken's Cafe or something, I would reach into templates and paper them on the walls and create this great environment and charge you money to go into it. And when you walk into it, the Second Life database would sort of tell your system what's visible to you. And then it would be rendered dynamically just as you've been seeing. And this is pretty, pretty um, powerful because today, you want to build stuff in Second Life, you actually have to be a programmer or use pre-existing content. So now, what's interesting uh, about this from a scalability challenge, and that's where I want to focus on uh, in this talk, uh, is that as you use live objects, you get a world with huge numbers of communication channels. Second life, when people interact with it, what's happening is you interact with, with your machine, which sends commands to their data center, their cloud computing infrastructure out in California, big warehouse. 
and the room you're in or the place you are uh, is owned by some computer which takes those commands, re-renders the environment, and spits out images to the various users. And Second Life gets very, very slow. If you go into a crowded discotheque or something, it's terrible. It gets very jerky. It's great when there's almost nobody around. That's because if that computer doesn't have too much to render, it does fine. And if it's got too much, it gets slow. And then weird things start to happen, like you can walk through the person you're dancing with and stuff. So, so Second Life has these issues. Now, um, we have the ability to be on the edge, to be uh, communicating peer to peer, meaning that you know, as your character dances, that data could be generated on your machine and sent directly to the other people who you're you know, are surrounded by in the discotheque. But if you imagine a world built that way, you start to realize that in order to support this, live objects have to scale in a dimension of communication channels impinging on this machine, and on your machine and other machines. So I've illustrated that. Imagine an air traffic control app built with weather notifications and radar tracks and air traffic control events and radar images. Mike mentioned that I actually worked on such a system with the French. We did the multicast piece of an architecture just like this. And it didn't have very many of these groups. So these would be groups in which you send multicast notifications. And the reason is that uh, it turns out that existing systems don't scale very well in that dimension. And you can't have very large numbers of groups. But if we use live objects the way I was showing you, even simple objects could be generating large numbers of groups. And complicated scenarios could be generating huge numbers of groups. So this guy's workstation might not be in five groups that are sending him data events. He might be in hundreds, 500 or 5,000. And we're going to need to scale well in that dimension. And the reason that traditional systems haven't scaled in that dimension is that we need to guarantee things, reliability, event ordering, so that people see events in the consistent order. And in order to do that, we pay overhead beyond just trying to push the bytes to the machine. And those overheads have traditionally been incurred on a per group basis. So our first scaling challenge is to ask whether there might be opportunities here to reduce those overheads so that I can give you the impression of being in hundreds and hundreds of separate groups, but in fact pay the costs of getting the bytes to you, which I still have to do, but pay the overhead just once, as much as possible at least. So we want to do that and sustain high data rates, and we want to do that uh, with overlap that arises in an organic way. Later, we want to worry about stronger properties. And existing multicast systems aren't going to be able to do this. Now, I'm not going to talk through this kind of a table. But what I've done is just to throw up some examples of things you may have learned about in courses here or taught about, for those of you who teach such courses. And what you realize is that, with the exception of maybe the things called publish subscribe message buses, they shouldn't be able to scale in this dimension. They, they really couldn't. But that pub sub message buses don't give very good properties. And furthermore, in fact, they are known to be unstable when you deploy them in large settings. For example, uh, Amazon and Yahoo both threw out the biggest vendor of a pub sub message bus, um, a company that uh, Mike Ryder is smiling because he knows the name of the people who sued me once. And I got back at them. I can indirectly mention that TIBCO's product doesn't work very well. Um, and uh, these systems thrash. In fact, I'm going to show you an illustration of what that looked like later in the talk. But they become unstable enough. So Amazon actually had their entire data center shutting down for 90 seconds at a time because of an attempt to use Publish Subscribe, which is just one of the ways of communicating in this kind of a pattern, on uh, a few thousand nodes at a time. So it's, it's sufficiently unstable that it's become a dangerous technology even consider using. So you can see what our research agenda starts to emerge as. I mean, obviously, don't buy that product. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking today at group overlap and ask whether there are regularities present that we might be able to exploit. This is becoming a passion for me. In fact, it's one of the most exciting research areas that I've run into in the, my recent career. And I'd like to say a little bit about why. Um, and then I want to show you that once we tease out some regularities, it's not that hard to design protocols that scale. I'll go quickly through that part of the, the talk. And last, I'll just touch on, on some of the directions we want to go next with this work for reliability, real time, uh, and other types of, of protocol support. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have live objects in some kind of an overlap pattern that arose organically because of people sharing stuff. And I want to ask, are there regularities present in that kind of a setting that I could exploit? Now, the regularity that inspires me is this one. So if the world was hierarchical this way, 
then it's obvious where there are opportunities to amortize. Because if you look at this computer, well, this computer and this one are in the same set of four groups. In fact, these three are. These two are in the same set of three groups. So I could take that big parent group and fragment it into one, two, three, four kind of regions. To send a message to it, I'd have to send four multicasts. But on the positive side, at that point, I'd have a group which had identical membership for the point of view of these three guys. I have to fragment this one, too. And so I could pay one overhead for reliability and ordering and stuff like that for this regional thing that I've come up with. And, uh, and basically, when I want to send a message to any one of these groups, I would send it to that region, and that would solve my problem. Okay. So that's my inspiration. But unfortunately, the real world is going to be some sort of a mess, right? So my wife will send me a, a really cool live object she ran into about the place we're going to go on vacation or something. And then I've got research collaborations underway. And each one of these involves patterns of sharing. And so each one of us is likely to have very different patterns of groups. And if you drew a picture from the top, you can imagine you know, Mike Ryder goes crazy. He's in tons of these groups. And this person's not using it as much. And, so, so where's the regularity there? So <clears throat> this, is, this is a world a bit like the web. And in fact, we can get some inspiration into how to solve it by thinking that, well, what we want to do is end up with that, right? And secondly, that maybe we can learn a little bit about what we'd like to do here by looking at the web. So for example, the web has RSS feeds. Those are multicast groups. We could look at patterns of use of RSS feeds. We could look at patterns of use of uh, Yahoo Finance, which has groups associated with channels to tell you about different stocks losing value lately. Um, they, uh, web pages. You could think about people who edit wiki pages in Wikipedia as the, as the nodes, and then the pages are changing. right? And so we could look at patterns of use in the real world and ask what the real world looks like and maybe find regularities. So our idea has been this. Let's imagine that we take this hierarchical kind of a structure. And our goal is to break the irregular structure up into a set of hierarchical structures. We need an algorithm that takes each one of these groups and assigns it to some hierarchy so that we only end up with nice, clean hierarchies. Every group is accounted for exactly once. It's in some specific hierarchy. And we'd like a small number of these hierarchies that are as steep and sort of heavily reusable as possible. And then we'll build our system for hierarchical settings. And if we have to run sort of a couple of instances of it, one per hierarchy, that won't bother us too much. So that's going to be the goal. So we'll call this a tiling problem. And the tiling problem is to build some small number of regular hierarchies. We'll call them cover sets. But I don't mean in the same sense as the set cover problem, although it's similar, actually, from theory. Um, just we'll call them cover sets or hierarchical sets. And uh, each group has to be in exactly one. And they should be nice and hierarchically clean, because we believe we can amortize once we get to that point. And um, we're also going to do something else. We're going to try to have most of the load be concentrated in as few of these as possible. And I'll show you we can accomplish that. The reason is this. At the end of the day, my computer may end up being in several of these hierarchies. But if most of the traffic is coming in on one of them, and I can optimize my system for that one high volume, high data rate, uh, hierarchy cover set, then the others won't matter very much if I can't do quite as well for the, for the low volume ones. It's, it's going to turn out we can do that. Now, this problem is, isn't looking too good. Because even as I've described it, you're starting to hear of an, an optimization over a very large space of possible arrangements. After all, if I've got g of these groups to start with, then there's 2 to the g uh, possible cover sets to consider. And uh, in fact, there's an equivalent problem called channelization, which has been shown to be NP-complete. So it's, a, it's fairly clear, in fact, this particular problem is, is a variant on channelization. So it, is, it turns out that this is a, an NP-complete problem. And we're not going to be able to solve it optimally in the general case. But we've discovered that the general case isn't really what arises. Remember when I was showing you this picture a second ago, I was commenting that there are lots of real world settings where we can look to see how people turn out to use multicast groups when they have lots of channels that they share. And it turns out that those real world settings 
are easier than the general cases that you use to prove things to be NP-complete. So when somebody tells you a problem is NP-complete, what they really mean is, I've got a, a, a procedure by which I can turn some other NP-complete problem into an instance of this problem. But the thing that they created might not be a pattern that would arise in nature. They did it to prove how tough they can be. In nature, the sharing of groups comes about because we share applications, which are like sharing web pages. And in nature, maybe those hard problems, those hard instances, don't arise. So we came up with a greedy algorithm, very simple. In fact, it's kind of the obvious one. And we coded it up. And it's going to turn out it works really, really well in real world settings we've been able to explore. So here's how the greedy algorithm works. Find some big group. And because of my interest in concentrating the traffic into a smaller number of heavy traffic groups, uh, aggregation turns out to be a really big win here. Find a big, busy group. Let's call it A. And then look for something that overlaps with A as much as I can. And maybe the best I could do was B. And again, I want a big, busy group. Now, it's true I'm optimizing in two dimensions at once, and there's a criteria. But don't worry about that. All right. So we ended up with A and B. And we'll say, OK, this is our candidate for our hierarchy. And then we'll do the same thing recursively in this region and that region and that region. And that'll build our hierarchies. And obviously, we look for exact matches at each step. So each time I do something, I check to see if there are any exact matches. Right now, I should check for exact matches with these two, with those three. Exact matches are a huge win once you do this little breaking up trick. And that's the whole algorithm. It's a greedy algorithm. And um, it, it shouldn't really work well, but it works incredibly well. So in, in particular, it works well for what seem to be uh, the power law distributions that arise in the real world. And I'm going to say more about this in just a, a second here. So uh, power laws uh, are a rise in nature. And people will show you, well, uh, OK, I got this stuff in the wrong order. Uh, maybe I'll come back to the power law story in half a second. Um, but they relate to what are called preferential attachment models of how people use web pages. And in fact, it's the same theory that explains why web search works well. Kleinberg, one of my colleagues, uh, is, is very known for his work on this theory. It's a theory of what they call hubs and authorities and um, leads to eigenvalue-based algorithms for figuring out which page to show as the answer to a search algorithm. And the reason they can do that, you probably know a little bit about the background. Each link kind of contributes some weight, and you want the famous pages, basically. Um, the reason that they can build that algorithm is because the web is structured, it's structured into these power laws. And so this hidden structure of the web, if it's present for communication groups, which undoubtedly it is, is going to turn out to be helping us by making the problem easier than the really hard cases that an adversary might construct if they wanted to show you how hard your problem really was. So here's an instance of how easy it was. We, we, we ran our greedy algorithm. Its complexity is roughly like sorting. It costs you roughly n log n. There's a step at which things can go quadratic, but it's not bad. And so here I've got an example where the number of groups in thousands is on the x-axis. So this is 10,000 multicast groups. And I've got up to 2,000 processes, nodes, computers, uh, joining 10% of the groups. So uh, over here, I've got 1,000 computers, 10,000 groups. Each one joins 1,000 groups. And now the question is, on average, how many hierarchies did they end up in when we ran our algorithm, which, by the way, only needs a few seconds for scenarios like this, on, on an inexpensive PC? There's nothing hard about this problem. And the answer is uh, 10. So we got a 100 to 1 compression ratio. That picture of the air traffic control system, I showed you with five groups. I should have shown it with 20 times as many. And it's even better if I ask, did I succeed in concentrating traffic, given it's going to turn out that I want to. So here you can see uh, the distribution of how many hierarchies nodes ended up in. The average is 10, but you can see there were some that were in as many as about 25, and some that were in as few as about 7. But if I looked at the groups that have the heavy load, and I assume that load varies as it seems to in the real world, 95% of the traffic is in just one or two of them for most nodes. Now, it won't always be the same hierarchy, but that says that any given machine finds itself not in 1,000 separate channels, but in 10, of which maybe one is delivering 95% of the messages.
resolve this, I'm not getting it. Well, I guess I believe that the future is likely to be a lot like the web. So you're and that, that insights popular web pages, just as there are popular web pages, there will be popular collaborative conferences in the same distribution will hold. Right, and there, just as in Second Life, there's a hot cafe or a really great island to go to or whatever. Um, there will be popular places in these collaborative environments and that uh, the characteristics of them will be similar to the characteristics of popular web pages and popular sites on the web. And that just as the popular sites in the web exhibit power law behavior, and I'll get to that in a half second, it's very likely that the distributions of attachment to groups will exhibit a power law. So these behavior. data that you used in your simulations, you got from actual... Ah, ah, very, very good question. All right, so hang, hang on to that question, I'll explain. Because um, it's a teaching opportunity here. I'll get to it on the next slide. Let me just, just mention, by the way, the algorithm, the sorting algorithm, as I, I mentioned along the way, look for exact matches. Exact matches in groups or in fragments of groups turns out to account for a tremendous amount of the compression. This is a log-log scale, so don't worry too much about how to interpret it exactly. This is showing how many groups are present in our system. Uh, as we look at this is topics or groups ordered by the load on them, and uh, it's looking at the initial picture, and then how many groups were left after the exact match stages uh, of the algorithm are counted, and how much came from the recursion and breakup stage. And it turns out that exact matching gives me a great deal of the benefit. And again, the, the intuition here ought to be that uh, if I create a very cool live object scenario and share it with you, you and I have an exact match on the so corresponding groups. Right? So to the extent that that occurs, or that machine placement of components occurs, you do get a lot of exact matches where multiple components use multiple groups, but the groups are on the exact same nodes. So that turns out to be a very big part of the benefit, and then you get a significant win still from breaking things up and looking for other overlap. Okay, so now what is this, uh, this preferential business and power law business? In fact, first of all, it's, it's a warning, because when we look at scenarios that don't have uh, the, the kind of characteristic I've been talking about, and I'll explain more about what that is in a second. If we look at scenarios where people join groups at random out of a big pile, our algorithm doesn't work at all. It does very, very badly. The algorithm works incredibly well with the synthetic data that I used a second ago to generate the scenario that I ran it on, and also with real data coming from IBM WebSphere where they automate the layout of groups, and they were able to give us traces of that. So there's a, at least one real-world setting where we do very well, and there's a synthetic setting of a type that a lot of people giving talks these days tend to generate where it does really well. But human behavior is not so obvious. Let me explain why. So when a person tells you uh, that a group has power law statistics, what are they talking about? And it's typically this. In nature, it is observed that many things have popularity that you can rank. That could be books being taken out at the local library, stocks that are being traded, all sorts of stuff. And what you notice is that if you graph the popularity of things, you get these, these exponential curves. So this particular one, um, the popularity of the most popular book is twice the popularity of the second most popular book, and that's going to be four times the third, and so on. It's, it's two to the k, right? So that's a power law. And in general, uh, power laws or ZIF distributions are uh, typically the most pop the kth most popular thing is popular with probability 1 over k to the alpha for some alpha. Okay, the alpha here is 2. So there, there are studies, millions of studies, showing that this is like a universal property of nature. Web pages, outlinks, inlinks, file sizes, popularity and data rates for equity prices, air, network traffic, you name it. Frequency of word use in natural languages, every, every human language, it turns out. Income distributions, at least in Western society, you name it, it's power law. Now, what does it mean when someone says something is power law? It turns out that in the systems community that I come from, everybody assumes that the power law means that somebody measures alpha and they say, oh, by the way, for groups that are a lot like yours, alpha is often 2.5. And then I should generate a distribution just like this, a nice clean line, and feed that into my algorithm. And that's what I did when it gave these very, very good results. But it turns out, of course, that that's not really what it means when somebody tells you that data is parallel. So what it really means is that uh, somebody took some experimental traces, say, of uses of stock feeds, 
And then they statistically, they extracted a model that's sort of supported by the trace. And uh, the way they do that is they plot log-log graphs, and they get a straight line. So Mike or somebody gets data from, say, the New York Stock Exchange or someplace, and it's a cloud, and he says, hmm, draw a straight line on that. Hmm, the slope of the line is negative 2. It's ziff with alpha equals 2. And that's, that's really what happens. So you see the problem is that we've lost track of the structure associated with the real data and simplified it. And then to make matters worse, to test our algorithm, we went and we generated synthetic data that really fit a perfectly straight line and reached a conclusion that our algorithm works incredibly well and plausibly well. So now we're left with a puzzle. In the real world, the data's got some degree of noise. You take that real algorithm that works so beautifully on straight lines, will it still work beautifully on real world traces? And this is the, the point that our research is starting to reach now. It's very hard to know because, as you were saying, until live objects are out there, how can I know how people will use them? To make matters worse, uh, companies like Google and Yahoo are incredibly proprietary about this kind of data. They're pretty casual about giving away data where they don't think it has value, but everybody thinks that this kind of data would have value, and so they're all secretive about it. They, they basically say, oh, you can test it here, but you can't publish on what you find, but we would like permission to take advantage of your work and without charge uh, if you ever get a patent on it. Um, so you're sort of stuck. You know that something happens in the real world, Maybe this algorithm works really well. In fact, we have, so what we're currently working on is um, we've been working with those kinds of companies to see if we can come up with a synthetic model that's supported by real world traces, which we can then take back to Cornell and use to generate all sorts of synthetic traces that would be reasonably accurate. Uh, and then we can test our algorithm on it. And that seems to be the best hope. Uh, for, for answering the question of whether we truly can use this simple kind of, of sorting algorithm or not. Now, given that we have all these doubts, what do we do? If I was a theoretician, I would probably stop and stare at the wall, but I'm a systems builder, so we built a system. So here's the system. First of all, I've already shown you the live objects framework. I'll give you an idea of how it was working. And then I want to drill down on how we're going to make the communication piece of its scale, assuming that the world behaves the way we're praying it works and, and that we think it works and, and that is weakly supported by the evidence so far. All right. So we saw this stuff. Uh, it, it has a type system, and I'll show you how that works. The user ends up building this complicated web page, and when they open it, it triggers our runtime, which interprets the web page to say, oh, I've got to instantiate this graph of about 35 objects. And they come into existence after an excessively long delay, and the planes are suddenly flying around over New Orleans. Okay. So here's a picture of one of those. The airplane was uh, a Windows XNA display interface. It works on Linux, too. Uh, that was talking to an object that models airplanes and renders their orientation changes, which was talking in turn to an object that encodes GPS coordinates as tuples, multicasts them, and then takes the incoming multicasts and passes them up to an airplane. This thing, I didn't show it, but it really connects to the GPS source for the corresponding airplane on one of the nodes. The other guys get a read-only copy, and one of the nodes is responsible for relaying the data. And there's a leadership election mechanism. I didn't show it, but it could be a separate object. And finally, at the bottom is a multicast protocol. Now, live objects, the way we've modeled them, are designed so that they're intended to capture protocol behaviors, replicated behaviors. So the average live object is supposed to look like this one. And these are live objects that don't bother to talk to their peers on the other machines, although they could if they wanted to. And so this is a typical picture. And then we type check on each one of these connections. OK? Sorry. I, yeah. I, 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 uh, that went by too quickly. You're passing GPS coordinates back and forth to different airplane models because they're living on different computers or because the airplanes are trying to avoid each other or they're following Well, I mean, uh, we'll go back and remind us. So here are the airplanes flying around. So each one of these is, as I just showed you, there is um, one of the members. See. You have to remember, by the time this is in real use, there might be 50 of us staring at this picture or at, at corners of this picture. We're sharing this scenario, right? So far, so good? So I built this search and rescue thing, and I gave you a copy. And I said, please go and search the French Quarter. 
and you and your team go to the French Quarter, and then I give somebody else a copy, and they're in the scenario. It's linked by the network, and every action you take on your copy is reflected on the other copies. That's the multicasting. All right? So now, each one of these planes is a group. One of the members of the group is, is tied to the GPS information for that plane and is relaying it through the multicast channel to everybody. And those events, those GPS events, now come up to the multiple endpoints which have to re-render the orientation of the plane on their particular screen. Okay? Okay, yeah, so that's the idea. So what, what actions are you, is the search team taking? Well, the search team would presumably be uh, mostly doing lighting up things that are safe, and red might mean some people need to be saved, and so forth. Okay? Um, and other, you know, and for that matter, Knowing where the supplies have been stockpiled might be very useful for telling people where to go to get water. So it, all sorts of things like that, right? Um, so they're, they're searching and they're annotating. They could be annotating the screen. They could be adding additional objects. An interesting feature of this system is that because it's built the way it was in .NET and so on, I can actually send you things you've never seen before and your system will download the code. So you might never have seen a model of this type of a convoy of trucks. But nonetheless, I can add one to the scenario and your system will display it. Um, now you can worry about the security implications of that. Mike probably is already getting anxious, but um, that's what we do. Now, so when is an object a live object and when not? It's an interesting question. I suppose that I could build something as a single object or as one of these stacks. When should I build it as a stack? So our thinking here is this, that um, the purpose of breaking things up ought to be to accomplish something. In particular, we want to accomplish a kind of plug and play flexibility. So our reason for building a stack of objects should be, hey, there could have been a different multicast protocol. I could replace this one with a wireless one. I could replace the wireless one with one that uses gossip communication for robots. Okay? In general, we want to say that the reason you function, you did things in these sort of chunks was because these captured the reusable and repluggable boundaries pretty nicely. Okay, so your choice, if you've got an object and you want to say, well, should I do a special purpose multicast protocol for GPS coordinates or a general purpose multicast protocol and something that knows that GPS coordinates are four tuples, well, you would pick, an, you'd pick two objects. Whereas if I said, should I do a separate multicast protocol that's totally ordered, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant and secured? Yeah, well, I might well do one object, actually. So the objects aren't intended to be small or big. And what's interesting about them is you generally break things into objects if you want to be able to replace a piece of functionality in different settings. In fact, what we're heading towards as much as possible is to be able to send an object to some strange setting that might be awkward and be able to configure it to work in that setting. And that's the main purpose of having multiple objects. Now, then, then all of this is type checked. And type checking actually drives a lot of the mechanisms. So the type checker checking runs at the component to component channels, the sort of sockets that plug things together. They ex each expose interfaces. The first level of type checking is to make sure that uh, the interfaces are compatible, type compatible in the sense that the events I pass you are the types you expect. Right? Strings or GPS coordinates or whatever. Secondly, um, we have a notion of constraints in which an object can expose constraints and say, if I'm connected to somebody, they must satisfy the following properties. And then somebody else can tell you what properties they satisfy. You can also tell your, your friend what, satisfies you, what properties you satisfy. And you can even supply a plug-in checker which could be a model checker or it could be a string matcher or something that looks at an instance of what you need, an instance of what your friend is offering, and sees if it's a happy combination. And that's completely extensible. Is there any composition code written at all, or do they just organically connect to each other? Uh, well, there is a case where they have composition code. So normally, when you drag and drop and mash things up, we'll, we'll compose them for you. However, one case can arise where you could dynamically generate different interfaces for different people. And in that case, it's a, what's called a reflection architecture. And so if I have a GPS object and two airplane objects, the GPS object can connect to either of them, and where's the control there? Mm -hmm. so well, that should, be, that should just, just com compose. Whereas, for example, an airplane that wants a secure channel, if it were to encounter a GPS object that doesn't offer security, it might type, not type check. 
depending on, on how you set the rules up. Okay. And uh, you can do all sorts of things. You can, for example, at runtime, you can use reflection mechanisms to change the interface. So I don't have a pilot's license, and I tried to jump into the pilot seat of plane three, and I can just look out the window. Perhaps Mike has a pilot's license, and he tries to jump into the pilot's seat, and it does show him controls, and he can literally fly the real plane. That would be doable. Um, we could substitute a different object. That would make sense if I, in a wireless setting, I should use a wireless multicast protocol, but in a wired setting. And as long as they are shaped the same, if you want to think that they behave the same, then the, the checker should determine that this is a compatible match and allow you to do it. And that's the way we do our design. And then once we've designed it, it's, it's the way we, we check things dynamically at runtime. This is a, a point on which we differ, by the way, from prior work. There's been a great deal of prior work, Genie, BAST, other systems, uh, in this space. Um, most of them use type inheritance. And it turns out that that's too constraining to be uh, usable here and essentially prevents people from building these kinds of platforms for a half a dozen reasons. Type inheritance means to build a B that's compatible with an A, I have to start with the A interface and refine it the way you do in uh, type inheritance languages like C++ or Java. And um, here what's happened is we've replaced that with a much more shape-oriented notion of type checking where if the channel seems happy with what it's connected to, we will let it try to run. Okay. And you build adapters? I mean, this got some interposition there too in the previous one? We can interpose as well. So and uh, so we can drive all sorts of dynamic adaptations. It's, it's probably a little too powerful. Uh, yeah, and we're this. worried and about the. How long the chain do you create, you know? Well, we don't know. But this is how we built it. And it seems to be uh, getting us pretty far so far. Um, so now let me, let me say a few words about the last piece of this, the scalable multicast that we're performing. Now, so, so what you have is a situation, we've got the live objects platform supporting composition of objects, and you've seen some user visible objects and how we built them. Um, we have a whole bunch of different multicast protocols that plug in underneath the surface here. So for example, I'm going to talk more about Quicksilver, which is a high performance scalable multicast that gives a weak reliability property. Um, we've been building a protocol called Ricochet that it looks like the Red Hat people would like to make part of a standard Linux distribution. Uh, Ricochet can be used as a live object. Uh, it gives you real-time, weak real-time properties. And um, we've been working on a gossip-based architecture. Originally, the idea came up when I was talking to Anne-Marie Karamak at, um, uh, at, at REN. And uh, although her project, her group is in the end not working with us on this, the idea dates uh, to that. And the idea here is to use what are called gossip communication protocols to support an infrastructure that scales out. So we're going to talk about Quicksilver in the last five, ten minutes or so here. Now, there are a lot of dimensions of scalability that matter. And uh, we've, we've been fascinated by them. I mean, there are tons of them. For example, could multi-core benefit from live objects? I, I know that John Manfredelli has visited here and likes the graphics work because you guys have done a lot of research on multi-core and graphics. Uh, well, not surprisingly, he got very excited about this. He said, oh, what a great match with multi-core. All these things are parallel. So it is true. It's, it's a very cool way. To, in fact, we're doing some work to see uh, whether our platform is helping or in the way relative to getting good performance out of multi-core. So QSM is just one of the scaling stories. But the question here is scalable, reliable multicast. So given an enterprise and given our algorithm for finding cover sets, can we do a good job on these hierarchical structures of, of uh, benefiting from hierarchy to amortize costs? So this is a hierarchy seen from the top instead of from the side. And so you've got regions corresponding to a set of machines that have identical membership. Um, and you can see the groups are the bigger sets. And this particular group was broken into four regions. And that group up there, four, they're all four, actually, in this case. Okay, And regions are uh, sets of nodes with identical membership. Right. I should mention, by the way, our algorithm, um, we looked at the question of how many regions we were producing. And the number, was, on average, was 1.2. So the average group got broken up into 1.2 groups. Nobody ever got broken up into more than five. Um, so to send a message, what you're going to have to do, if a node wants to send to group A, A is broken into regions. So first, you can take the messages you're sending to A, and you can potentially aggregate them. Aggregating is really important to us. But then once you've got a nice, big, chunky message you want to send to A, what you actually do is you, you try to send it independently to each of the regions, the A region, the ABC region, and so on, where you can aggregate with other traffic from other groups going to the ABC region. 
and get nice big messages. And the reason we're trying to do this is because the efficiencies of modern networks are such that sending a big message is a zillion times better than sending the same number of bytes in multiple small messages. Almost incomparable. Um, and there, you can think about why. It has to do with having to traverse the OS stack many times. But basically, if you're going to go down there to the interface, send a lot of bytes. So we're getting two opportunities to send bigger messages. And that's a good thing, because GPS coordinates are only a couple of bytes. A lot of these live object messages might be tiny. Whereas if we can send big things to regions, we're going to get a huge efficiency. The next thing we do is we do a regional recovery protocol that runs independent of the number of groups in the region. It just ignores the group structure. So the ith message to the region has a unique ID. And what we do is it, superimposed on each region is um, a little token ring or a set of them built hierarchically. The token zips around to see which messages Mike has and which messages John has and which messages I have. And if it turns out that Mike is missing something that I've got, I forward him the missing message. In fact, I do it along the ring. So if a message is missing, 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 found, that missing message is sent back, back, back. And it turns out that this scales incredibly well. And we end up with an architecture that performs extremely well. I'll show you that in a second. Now, uh, performance turned out to be dominated by some obvious things. For example, it seems clear that reliability and is going to be, uh, you know, is going to determine uh, the amount of time and work you do in these rings. And so therefore, the bigger the ring, the slower you'll get. And that's true. CPU load should obviously determine performance, and it does. But one thing that we discovered that was really unexpected, if you take networking courses, everybody always teaches in networking courses about caching, cache stuff, buffer stuff. In our setting, the bigger the memory footprint of our system, the worse the performance. And it was such a dramatic effect that the single biggest thing that we did that improved performance was to notice this and to build a really minimal memory architecture. It does things like, if I'm going to send a packet to Mike, what I really keep around is a promise to send the packet. I generate the packet as the data is about to be sent. And the reason that that's interesting is that many mechanisms in modern distributed systems um, can generate the data at the last minute. And it might even be fresher if you generate it at the last minute. It might be my state or something. And it's a smaller promissory note than the true packet would have been. And this kind of thing has let us come up with a very minimal memory design. Now, there was another issue. QS, QSM stands for Quicksilver. Scalable multicast. Yeah. Uh, another thing we ran into, I mentioned earlier that uh, some products out there perform very badly under stress. And this is an illustration of our system having the same problem. Here you can see it oscillating between saturating a 100 megabit Ethernet at 10,000 1K messages a second and getting zero throughput. The product I mentioned had 90 second blackout periods. Amazon experienced that. It was actually blacking out their entire data center. This isn't having that phenomenon exactly, but it's comparable. What's going on here is the thing is speeding up until it hits a data rate at which packet loss starts to occur throughout the data center because of overload. At that point, hundreds of nodes, this is on, I think, 200 nodes, um, start to squawk simultaneously. Missed packet 15. I missed packet 19. The overhead levels shoot through the sky. The good put level drops to zero. Some period of struggling to get the messages retransmitted ensues. Eventually, they've gotten through. And then we just recycle again and again. And it just thrashes up and down. Um, and the version that occurred at Amazon, the loads on their gigabit ether were so high that no good traffic could get through at all. It was entirely saturated with overhead messages. Now, when you look at this, it turns out to be interesting. It's a priority inversion, even though it's a distributed version. It comes about because when systems run on very, very fast networks, and the machines themselves are slowish machines like we have here, the network can deliver data faster than the machine can soak it up. And so the machine drops packets. This is a new failure model that did not get observed 15 years ago when Linux and systems like it were, were designed. So they're not prepared for this. And they get very lossy in these situations. Suddenly, you're sending a multicast, and 2 thirds of the copies don't get through, strictly because the network delivered too much data too quickly. So the recovery data now gets delayed by other data. And the longer you wait, the more backlog emerges. It forms what's called a convoy effect. And you see this in databases, too, where things pile up. And you get these long chains. Everyone is waiting for Mike to fix his problem. And everyone is idle. Suddenly, Mike says, hey, I'm OK again. And a, and a huge volume of noise erupts. And now everyone's waiting for, for 
can to fix his problem. And it just oscillates this way. So what we realized is that, well, you know, this is a familiar kind of scenario. You've seen it too. If this thing could just get up where they want it, then the traffic jam wouldn't form. And so we came up with an architecture that basically gets the good new packets to the side so that the high priority repair packets can get passed. And you know, it fixed the problem completely. So here's an example of data sustainably being delivered at about 95 gig, uh, megabytes uh, per, megabits per second, which is the saturation point for this Ethernet. This is two senders, here's with one. And now, in the picture with thrashing, our, our aggregated throughput would have been a tenth of that at most, but, uh, and probably much less. But here we're actually sustaining very steady delay. We, we can't provoke this into thrashing with any of our experiments. We're on as many as 200 nodes. Now, that may not sound a lot these days. People hear about Google and their tens of thousands of machines. But I'll just mention that IBM's flagship multicast product, DCS, runs on no more than 75 nodes. So this graph by itself has the IBM people very, very interested. This is an interesting graph, despite the fact that it does not have 100,000 nodes. Uh, when we try to publish on this, we do sometimes run into people who work at Google who write nasty reviews that say, forget it, you can't convince us this is interesting unless you run it on as many nodes as we have, and no, you can't run them here, at least if you plan to publish on it. I'm not sure what to do about that. It's a new phenomenon in the systems area. The crowd that says you can only do good systems work if you do it at Google, but it seems to be a phenomenon. Now, this is uh, an illustration of uh, the memory phenomenon I mentioned before. So here, what we did was we took that same traffic, about 90, well, actually, with one sender, it was um, about 80 megabits. And now what he does is he sends it either in one group, which is way down here, or he spreads that traffic over 8,000 groups, or you know whatever number is on the x-axis, OK? Same traffic, just I send it in one group, or I send it all in multiple groups. And now, what you can see is you get a slow degradation as a function of how many groups you're using. 8,000 would mean my computer is in 8,000 live object patterns. That's, that'd be a lot, right? Now, what's the red line? What we did was just to illustrate for you the effect that memory is having, we padded the data structure used by the sender, only that one machine, to have, just have some extra bytes that we never touch. And as a function of, of doing that, we can drive this curve down. And if you look at it really carefully, it turns out that uh, this is strong evidence that the problem is that um, memory is very, very costly. Now, we were working, I should say, in .NET C Sharp, which is like Java. It's a managed environment. But oddly enough, it's not garbage collection overheads that we're seeing. In fact, it shouldn't be, because garbage collecting an object that's twice as big should not really be twice as expensive. And it, it's costs associated with every element of the memory system that are inflating as more memory is in use at the center. We don't understand the phenomenon, but we do understand that keeping our system sparing in the use of memory is key to scaling. And that's the scaling curve we currently get. So we can scale in numbers of live objects up to thousands. We can scale on numbers of nodes. We only had 200 nodes to test on. We're trying to find a way to get to more of them. And that's pretty much where I'm going to wrap up. I'm just going to summarize uh, with one or two slides and then take any more questions you've got. So what do we have today? We've got a platform. If I had the kind of displays that appear to be really common here at UNC, um, I could actually build Tom Cruise's thing, except that you'd have to supply the precogs. Right? But everything else is there. And, um, and we could share this out and do a, an, an intervention or whatever they call it. And it would really be very much the experience that you seem to see in that movie of pulling content. We, we have ways to pull data from cloud platforms like Microsoft's uh, Virtual Earth or Google's uh, Google Earth. Just pull that stuff in. The map I showed you, for example, could have been from one of those. It would pan if you moved around. So cloud stuff can be in here, and then edge content as well, which is kind of cool from a security point of view, because one of the concerns many people raise these days is, if Google becomes the center for everything, does that mean all of my private data will vector through Google when I message my friends, use things like Twitter? Will every successful application end up owned by Google? My GPS coordinates, who I phoned the other day when I didn't want anyone to know, will all of that stuff be known to Google? Did you know that Google already archives your data? And they debate how long they argue they archive it for in Europe. Uh, there was a whole question, did they archive it for six months? They finally conceded in Europe, they keep your data for nine months, all of your data. 
They claim they have to. I don't know why they have to. Europe is saying, no, 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 it shouldn't be more than six. Why should they be keeping all of your data for even six months? Now, with live objects, a lot of the communication is occurring out on the edge. You can make that choice and say, hey, the best way to communicate between me and my friend is with secured, encrypted communication on the edge, and they cannot get their fingers into that stuff. This is a very appealing model if you believe in fighting against the big brother of the future. It's thank goodness that Cheney didn't understand what Google can already do and that <laughs> Schmidt supported Obama. Because just think about what this world could be like if Cheney had been sophisticated and Google was run by people who hate freedom, right? <laughs> so you know why they have the don't be evil thing up over the men's room uh, urinals? They do actually, believe it or not, over the men's room urinals, they, they have a sign, do not be evil. Um, it's because it's so evil, it's easy to be evil if you're Google. Anyone working there, and whereas half the guys there made billions, anyone who goes to work there now just makes a salary unless they steal data and sell it to an insurance company or use it to, you know. So, so I like the idea of live objects as a covert strike against the machine. Um, now, what are we doing with it? A guy who built PP Live, which is a very well-known Chinese data streaming system that's used literally on millions of machines now to stream video, is building a version of live object, over live objects with us. He's almost got it working. It's supposed to be running when I get back to Ithaca. Um, the gossip object stuff is about to start working. We're building what we're calling a properties framework, which takes the Quicksilver scalable multicast and superimposes a script that lets you strengthen the reliability guarantees from best effort, which is basically, it's actually, it's a weird model. Best effort with an, an oracle that tells you if nodes have failed or not, to uh, virtual synchrony, Paxos, Byzantine agreement should be possible, transactions. So we believe that we can express all of those in a high-level language, and that we can get very good performance, but not scaling in the number of groups. We can scale in the size of groups with this thing, but not the number of groups. So we're thinking, well, you might use lots of Quicksilver groups and a couple of groups with other properties. And we think that could work. This thing has to self-configure. We're building a self-configuration service based on what they did with PP Live, where they got a lot of experience in the internet WAN. Um, we have a Linux port that's almost finished. So with that, I'll just mention that you can get the stuff if you want, and I'd love to have users. Uh, it's documented. <laughs> right the second you'd have to use it in Windows, the Linux version should be out in February. Um, we do have a lot of users. We've been using it in our classes at Cornell now for two and a half years, and uh, with pretty good success. So it's not a terrifying experience. Um, it's maybe not the very easiest thing to use yet if you have to do programming in it, but it's really getting there. And I think the match with a lot of what's going on here would be awesome. So uh, we'd love to get people contributing content, new kinds of objects or new kinds of apps. And uh, with that, I'll thank you. So. Okay, so uh, any questions? I'm sorry, you're pointing to what? No, I'm saying the first ask didn't work. Uh, oh, okay. Right. Remote sites, any questions? I guess they can hear me through this. I don't know if they've been able to hear anything at all, but uh, <laughs> we'll find out soon. Uh, we see the person at the remote site. <laughs> you could do something? We heard something. Go ahead and ask. Yeah, we have a question. Okay, talk loud. Hi, uh, my name is Amit Chopra. Uh, I have a question that relates to service oriented computing. Uh, as an abstraction, how are live objects <clears throat> different from uh, services? Because uh, you talk about the same things, composition, mashups. Uh, I, I, I basically essentially see your talk as being in two parts. One being uh, live objects as an abstraction, and the other being the optimizations for multicasting. So could I use those optimizations in service-oriented architectures? Uh, you know, where do you, what is the difference between the two? Well, uh, as an example of a project that my students have been doing in, in, in my master's class this semester, quite a few of them are building um, wrappers for service-oriented services, f such as Virtual Earth and, and Google Earth, which are both accessible that way. And they'll let you pull that kind of content into a live objects app and share it out. You end up with um, multiple endpoints that could either be talking JavaScript AJAX or Kaja or something, or using some kind of a, an RPC style interface, web services interface, to talk to the remote service. The service isn't itself exploiting multicast in that pattern. It's a, 
uh, it's a, it's a one-to-many pattern with the cloud computing infrastructure. The service is at the hub. So um, what we think of this as is more of a unifying model. Where I differ, I think, from web services is that live objects are intended to uh, often capture replication protocols and multicast protocols that run on the edge. I didn't get it extremely detailed about how we're doing that, but quite a lot of the detail of the system is, is replication-centric, even if many objects aren't. So whereas JavaScript and the trends in that direction in the, in the service-oriented world are trying to make it easier for the web center to send an app to my, my browser and run locally, they're not offering a way to collaborate except by vectoring the data back into Second Life or into Twitter or whatever and out to the edge users. The live objects uh, are, are relatively um, polymorphic and comfortable. If, if in a given setting, the efficient thing to do or the secure thing to do is to communicate directly peer-to-peer -peer on the edge, they'll make that choice and be able to configure themselves appropriately. So the mashup you end up with with live objects can be a mixture of cloud content coming from these service-oriented solutions in their paradigm and peer-to-peer -peer content coming directly on the edge using a real-time protocol or using a wide area tunneling protocol or using IP multicast. And it comes together in a single seamless collaboration solution. Okay, I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but that's how we think of it. And uh, you, so therefore, you could build the same thing. In fact, Second Life is an example of the same thing built with a data center at the center, but its scaling problems illustrate why that's a potential issue. If every byte has to go to Second Life out in California, high latencies, they can get overloaded, and they see every byte of your conversations, which maybe isn't something that all of us want all the time. So, yeah. Another question? Um, yep. No, I don't know. Three of you have your hands up. Are there any more remote questions? Uh, are there more remote questions? I don't know the protocol. Um, just... How long has it been? Uh, since the beginning of the internet, uh, so you mentioned the group patterns. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have any comments on how dynamic are those patterns and how this dynamics affect the system? Yeah, well, we do have a little bit of information about that. So um, if uh, if groups are used the way we expect they are, and if the model is similar to the web, we don't believe they'll be extremely dynamic. However, our collaborators at IBM Haifa don't agree with me about this. They say that in uh, data centers that they've been observing, some applications have extremely dynamic group membership, usually because of mistakes. So we've been asking ourselves how to deal with that. If it's true that it's usually between, because of mistakes, we can protect ourselves against that type of a bug rather easily. If applications need extreme dynamicism, I don't know offhand how to solve that problem right now. And probably we just won't be able to support them. And people with that need will just have to find a different way to build the solution. Now the evidence from looking at the web is that that type of dynamicism should not be so common because the action of building an application is a slow kind of thing and then sending you a copy. Of course, if millions of people are dynamically changing the app, it's changing, but it's changing in ways that are only visible to some of them at a time. So we doubt that that's a problem, but if it's a serious issue in the real world, we're not going to be able to address it, not anytime soon. There are a lot of costs associated with dynamics for groups. Good. All right, thank you. Yeah, so the three of you had questions. I don't know who was first. So you mentioned, you know, ne network latencies would be high if you go to Second Life servers in California, depending where I am. So, but if I understood it correctly, uh, I mean, I see how the groups you form help uh, result in better use of networking. But these groups have nothing to do with, you know, how far these are. In fact, if I have to make three hops, I could be going from here to Brazil to China and then back here instead of just to the Second Life server and back, right? Why three halves? I don't know how many groups I'm going to go through, you know, as the multicast. Uh... Well, no, I mean, if you're dancing with someone in, in our version of Second Life, the events associated with re-rendering your avatar are going directly to the counterpart, the other members of, of that group, the one that's watching, the, the other players watching your avatar right. in some compressed mode. So why would it be three halves? I mean, it would be the multicast, ideally, is just going directly there is a reliability issue, and to the extent that we care, but we may not even care about that. If, if we care about reliability, you have to worry about how recovery will be done. But that could be going straight. Now, 
true. I mean, the person you're dancing with might be in Brazil, but it, uh, but you know, Ithaca, California, Brazil is still going to be faster than Ithaca, Brazil. Uh, it's slower than Ithaca, Brazil, generally speaking. So, um, so we should have a performance benefit in this, most of these states. Furthermore, that server in California can easily get very overloaded. Yeah, you yeah. want to overload that. So, um, yeah, you had a question too. Uh, you had a question, but if you don't anymore. <laughs> So we need rendering data, especially in the multicast stream, when you talked about the Convoy effect, where you have recovery messages going back and forth. The utility of the recovery messages degrades over time, correct? Because you're not, you know, as the object get rendered, some of the messages get timed out. Right. So isn't there a certain utility to be maintained with the, each message so that the expire message is over? That's or? a very good point. Uh, the Ricochet protocol I mentioned, uh, is, is optimized in the way you're thinking about. It's right. a real-time protocol, and if messages get old, it gives up on them. Um, the Quicksilver protocol is optimized to try to guarantee delivery, and unless it thinks the node has failed, which it's told by a supervisory node, uh, it won't give up. Uh, but there's a supervisory mechanism that will cause it to give up after a short delay. So it depends on the reliability model you ask for. And in general, you would connect an object to something specifying the degree of model you need and anything stronger ought to work if you can test for that constraint. I think I'm a little late. Maybe one last question. Is, Mike, do you have a preference on who gets to ask it? Yeah. Right. Um, do you ever synchronize or uh, offer uh, to synchronize two messages coming from two live objects to a single client? When I was mentioning that we can enhance the reliability properties of Quicksilver, those are the kinds of, of properties that we can, we can offer with the stronger guarantees. Now, as it happens, um, Quicksilver delivers messages in the same order to any given region. And so actually Quicksilver is an ordered delivery algorithm where everybody does see the same events in the same order. Everyone who sees the same events sees so, the same order. And way. you maintain that even though you partition stuff in? We do, we do. But, um, but, but there are properties we're not giving just the same in that, in that kind of a context. And the stronger reliability models I mentioned enhance these, these basic ones to, to, into uh, things comparable to Paxos, for example, which has ordering and persistence and other kinds of guarantees, um, which, which we don't have normally. All right, so I, I think I have to thank everybody again. And it's been wonderful being here today, except my voice is getting kind of crackly. And uh, come visit us at Cornell sometime. Visit our webpage.